Good morning, everyone. Hopefully we should uh, have you all here now and you should be able to see me live on your screens. Uh, welcome to another of Keystone's morning webinars. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to a panel of experts uh, about gap years. And um, I'm really excited uh, to, to welcome two people. Firstly, Andrew McKenzie, who's the Managing Director of Africa Asia Venture, known as AV for short. And AV has been, been in this industry for 25 years and has helped nearly 6,000 people between the ages of 17 and 25 and from 30 uh, to travel to 30 plus countries. Um, and has contributed to 100, what, sorry, 1,200 man years of service to developing communities in Africa and Asia. So some really productive um, uh, sort of trips uh, that AV, AV have been involved with. And I'm also uh, delighted to welcome Dr. Jonathan Burbage, who's a house master and teacher of geography and classics at Teddy's, at St Edward's Oxford, was formerly at Dulwich College and North London Collegiate School. So the idea is that we've got uh, this sense of uh, the mentoring and the pastoral, the advice that you might get from within school uh, about gap years, and then also a sort of a gap year expert uh, who, who sort of provides um, opportunities to students who are looking uh, for, for community-based work um, internationally. As with all of our webinars, the idea is to have a sort of structured conversation um, in which um, you will listen in to, to our experts, uh, Jonathan and Andrew, uh, uh, fielding a, a series of, of questions. But please, if you have your own questions, do type them into the chat box um, and we will endeavour to, to get back to you sort of ASAP. If we feel that we can address the question immediately, we absolutely will, um, but I will try to acknowledge it and then uh, give you the opportunity uh, hopefully later on I'll, I'll, I'll start um, quick fire uh, firing questions to, to, to Andrew or Jonathan respectively if you feel your questions should be directed to one of them please just just say you know for Andrew or for Jonathan and then and then I can uh, address them great so let's get started um, so we're going to talk about gap years and how to plan a gap year in a socially distanced world. But I thought before we kind of jump into to that sort of information, I wonder whether it might be sensible to define what we mean by a gap year. In my experience uh, in educational advisory in schools, I think the term is banded around, but I think it's poorly understood. So, Andrew, given your experience, uh, long experience in, in, in the gap year industry, I wonder if you could define what you understand uh, by, by a gap year. Yeah, I think I think the most important thing is to say that um, a gap year is not um, a year off; it's a year out, and and we see it as an opportunity to to gain uh, an awful lot of life experience, a chance to do something different, um, and and we believe most importantly these days an opportunity to create some really standout experience on your CV because for most young people when they're going into the employment market these days it is going to be a very very competitive um, market and anything that they can have that can make them stand out from the pack uh, in terms of productive meaningful experience which maybe we'll talk about later then we see this as a great a great opportunity um, in essence I would say you know a meaningful gap year can be a CV enhancing experience and a wasted gap year mm. is a missed opportunity. That's a, that's a nice definition. Thank you. I guess what would be great is we have the capacity here on our webinar to poll and I'm going to launch a poll now uh, to those participants to ask you what is your main priority for uh, a gap year and we've got some options there so building work experience, international travel, community work, and volunteering, uh, learning another language, you might be retaking exams or reapplying to university. So if you could quickly uh, sort of indicate where you're, you're coming from, that'd be very helpful. And it means that also we can start to direct questions uh, specifically uh, to, to Andrew and jo Jonathan sort of you know, in, in response to, to, to kind of where most of you are coming from. Um, so I guess that, that leads into, we've got a definition now, Jonathan. I wonder what, what kind of students in your experience of being a schoolmaster do you advocate take gap years and why? It's quite interesting. Um, I completely agree with what Andrew said in terms of CV building and, and you know, opportunities for doing something that's different and enriching. Um, I think in my experience, I personally, um, and certainly the, the, the sense I get from a lot of um, people around school is that actually gap years for anyone 
by nature and it's a time period in which you can pretty much do anything um and i don't necessarily believe it fits one particular type of person specifically it can fit those that don't have a sure idea of what they want to do next um in terms of exploration and finding opportunities to test things test the waters but also actually if you didn't have a really good idea of what you want to do it's, it's almost perfect in that scenario you can line things up that are tailored to your particular interests that will potentially have a direct impact on your career um your career choices further down the line, particularly in a, in a lot of cases, you can get a lot of experience uh, towards things that are um, relevant to your university course choices. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't personally think that um, it, it particularly suits anyone in 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 particular. It, it is an opportunity for any student with any ideas or without ideas. Um, and I think that's crucial because as Andrew and you have both referenced, I think it's become misunderstood this notion of a gap year and, and it's almost become a, you know, capital G, capital Y um, specific thing for people to just go traveling and, and, and waste the year. But actually it is merely a time period for you to do whatever you want. Um, and if you fill it productively, um, it, it is a huge, huge boost to any aspirations you have. That's really interesting because I think one of the things that, that I've often come up against is this notion that um, if you have a very organised student in front of you, uh, a student that let's say knows what they want to do at university, then then perhaps it's you know gap years aren't for them because they're they've almost got their kind of the next three four five years of their lives mapped out. Um, do you still advocate to students who come to you perhaps in the house that are um, you know highly organised and and together and know what they're doing next? Uh, as much as you do to those students who perhaps are maybe a little aimless and don't know quite what they want to do, understandably, not sure what the, the future holds. Absolutely, 100%. So what I've got some myriad example. I've got an example of a, a, a boy in my current lower sixth who's hugely interested in medicine. And he's lined up an internship at a medical firm in Germany for you know 18 months time where he's going to go after he finishes school he's going to go and work in a medical firm in germany um interning volunteering it's, it's essentially but uh, he's got a placement there lined up he is he's sort of hungry and ambitious and loves school loves learning hugely organized and part of that organization has been to to sort of progress his prospects to enhance his cv um before going to university. You know, this is something that will stand him out from the crowd mm. by the time he gets to university. You know, so already that organization and that ambition, mm. I think is, is serving him really well. I, there's this essence of, of losing momentum, I think, and, and those, this is where I think there is a bit of a disconnect in, in current conceptions of it, in that those students that, can, that go through school really productively um, throughout their teenage years, which let's face it, teenagers are not always conditioned to do, um, to be productive at school. Not, not all teenagers do that, but there are certain teenagers that are hugely productive, go through school, and there's almost that fear of losing momentum. Mm. When actually there's no sense of, of losing any momentum because it depends what you fill the year with. If you're productive, you're maintaining that momentum and you're actually boosting your CV in a way that, that is interesting and dynamic and not merely sort of seeing education as something to get over and done with while I'm up to speed and then, and then I'll collapse afterwards. It's this notion that actually, well, uh, you know, education and learning and progressing through to university and beyond is an experience in itself and something to be valued and enjoyed rather than be done with as quickly as possible. Um, you know, and I, whilst I was doing a little bit of research for this, I did pop onto the UCAS website and have a look at, you know, their recommendations. And it says it on their website, you know, almost verbatim, that the extra year of maturity makes better students. You know, they caveat it by saying, in many cases, but, mm. you know, in many cases, that extra year of maturity does make better students. Um, mm. and so you have that year of, year of interesting CV boosting um, opportunity and then you go to university potentially more mature ready to learn you know in a better place 
and with a with a CV that's obviously got something really interesting or, or a series of really interesting things to talk about. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to share the results of our poll because um, it, it, it's clear that the you know, building work experience, international travel, and community work and volunteering are are really big parts of uh, of, of what uh, the people listening are are keen to do. Um, and and that's so great that we've got you both because it means that you can <laughs> you can cover all of those bases. Um, but just I guess. Let's focus on the international travel, the community work and volunteering. I just wonder, Andrew, you know, what sort of opportunities do, do, do AV offer and, and what, what are the benefits of these opportunities and why is it that you offer them? Yeah. Can I, can, uh, and Ed, can I just add something to um, the last topic that Jonathan was saying? Because I, I, I hope it might be of real interest and a lot of people don't know. It. But Harvard um, proactively recommends that every freshman take a gap year now they don't i hasten to add you know they they, they don't all take a gap year mm. but harvard for many years has mm. encouraged people not to come mm -hmm. and to me that is very powerful so that is very highly motivated young people who know exactly where they're going mm. uh, they're going to the best university in the world and they're encouraged to take a gap year um mm. And, and I just think that's a really important thing. The other thing I was just going to add was that, that uh, again, just reinforcing what Jonathan was saying, that um, uh, we have seen in the past real interest in universities, in, in people who, who have done gap years. Uh, I remember once at a, at a higher education fair where somebody from York University came over to our table and said, oh, we, we love we love people um, who, who uh, you know, who've done AV. And I said, why? And they said, because they come in much more mature. Um, they, they are much more committed to their studies. They cause much less trouble. Um, and they have a much more productive relationship. Basically, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the boozing and all the rest of it at the beginning of the gap year, they've actually done it. So they're more interested in getting stuck in. They are much more mature. When I asked York if we could put that on our website with, you know, they said, no, 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 please don't do that. Because, of course, they don't, I'm afraid, want to stop people coming in. So a lot of universities now, I think, are a bit like airlines. You know, they want they want bums on seats. They want fees and all the rest of it. Hmm. Um, but with but, regards to kind of what you offer then. Um, so how uh, what sorts of opportunities, um, yeah. given that quite a few of the people um you know within within our audience are interested in international travel and community work what what okay you've obviously done 1200 man years of service developing communities in well, Africa. Yes. so what, what do you offer in your introduction you got me slightly wrong where you said we went to 30 countries i apologize that might be wrong we 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 have had people from over 30 countries travel with us so they were based in the uk hmm. we have had people from from over 30 countries the us is our second largest market um we, we specialize in what we term as group-based full immersion programs. What we mean by that is we never send people on their own. So they're always going as, as part of a group. Normally our group sizes are fairly small. I would say between five and eight, something like that. Mm. They are then going to live together in the community. We, we, go to what I would term as semi-rural locations. So we don't go to major cities, perhaps for obvious reasons, but we have to be within reasonable access of medical facilities and things like that. So we go to semi-rural locations. Mm -hmm. And in those locations, our people will live in their own accommodation, but actually in the community, with the community, the same standard of accommodation and so on as the locals. So the whole point of everything we do is they become part of the community. So also, unlike others, we don't, um, we don't do a lot of traveling around. So the whole point is becoming part of that community. There will be others who will offer you a week here and a week there and so on, which to us is more of a, um, you know, a tourist type uh, experience. We want them to become part of the community. And the reason we want them to become part is we believe they will give more and they will get more from the experience. Mm -hmm. And in terms of what they do, really everything we do, and, and these are, you know, as I say, only in, uh, we only go to nine countries in, in Africa and Asia. And all of our programs involve um, our guys working with young primary and secondary school children. 
principally teaching them to read and write English, but helping them maybe with other academic subjects, maybe with sport, drama, dance, anything they want to do, they will be able to do. Um, and the reason, so we have, and we have had, Jonathan mentioned medic, we've had a lot of medics come with us mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the experience is actually all about managing people in different situations. It is not medically based though. Sure. Um, and so they, and so they get really involved with the kids. They get really involved with the community. And because our programs are a little bit longer than most others, so our most popular ones are um, 16 weeks. Um, it does mean that the people really get to know some of the locals really, really well, and they become, you know, very attached. Um, but the other reason that we do what we do is that we are taking young people who are unskilled, unqualified, but they are enthusiastic, and our argument is they can help make a difference. And where they can help make a difference is actually with those young children. Mm -hmm. So that's why we do what we do. So I just think I might skip on to ask you another question, if I may, Jonathan, rather than kind of come to you, uh, just because in light of, uh, I, I can see a couple of questions have come through um, uh, on, on our, on our Q&A and also on our chat. In light of the current uh, pandemic, how is that going to affect your offering? What are you, you know, how is that affecting the, the students that you have that are booked on to go, uh, I, I guess, from September onwards? Um, how are you... How do you see the, the kind of the, the gap year provision that, that you're offering these these wonderful opportunities changing? Uh, uh, that is, sorry, was that for me? No, yeah. if I could just fire that at Andrew, and then I'll, I'm going to come yeah. back to you, Jonathan, just a moment. Wow. Um, that 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 is a uh, really good question, and um, well, at the moment, it's a simple answer in that we have had to say to everyone, everything is on hold. So. Um, because of where we travel to, I mean, international travel isn't possible anyway. Uh, so at the moment, um, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't envisage people going on our programs in the summer or in September. And, uh, we, you know, we hope that things might come back to, should we say, nearer normal in some places in January slash February. But it, it's very difficult to say. So there, there, potentially, though, that there is an opportunity, potentially, uh, obviously, with, with further guidance, clearly, uh, I guess, from both our government, but also governments around the world willing to accept people. Um, if, 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 if these options, um, you know, these options may be, your options are longer, further international travel might be available in January and February. Yes, I, I, exactly. I mean, that's what we're hoping for I mean I should say as well that we have gone further than most other travel organizations I don't know if you've heard but there's been quite a hoo-ha about travel companies not paying back uh, people who, who have paid deposits and so on we have actually reimbursed so everybody who we had booked mm -hmm. um, they didn't cancel I hasten to add but we okay. what we have done is we have reimbursed the money saying because we don't know you know when things mm -hmm. are going to go so I'm very proud that we've done that well, well done you and yeah. presumably though with 16 week programs there's an opportunity um albeit that obviously ideally people would start in september and and go uh prior to christmas but clearly if if, if things do settle down there's plenty of opportunity from sort of january and even if it's not january but later on in the year because you know universities don't start until september october time so that there hopefully should be time um yeah. it, it, you know all being well um there should be opportunity even if it's somewhat delayed um uh, yeah. to, to, to kind of get on on, on these ones and um, I, I can see well, sorry Ed, but, yeah, but that's a good point because traditionally what we have seen here in the UK is, is of course young people leaving school in July the most popular departure time for us is January or February anyway so what okay. they have done historically is actually work we, we would argue that a key part of a gap year experience is funding it yeah, yeah sure not being not being given it by their parents Sure, many parents would argue that too. <laughs> yes. So that actually, um, yeah. if they're leaving, say, obviously in the UK, if they're leaving in in July and they're working through to Christmas, and then and then often they will go in January, February. So that could that could yet happen this year. Okay. Well, I, I think we I know we've got a couple of other questions about what alternatives might there be within Europe or within the UK, um, and I and I see we've got a question about a particular type of student to 
who's planning to do a particular type of degree, which I know we will address uh, um, in, 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 a, in a few moments time. Uh, but Jonathan, I wonder if I could come to you, because this may, may link into some of these questions now. Um, what sorts of um, what sorts of opportunities uh, are, are there in terms of that, that you might recommend that aren't perhaps internationally minded travel a bit like the student you mentioned uh, with with medicine in Germany? I appreciate that's in Europe. Uh, and what might be the benefits of those? So I'm thinking things like work experience internships, yeah. uh, th those sorts of options that would be quite different yeah. to what Andrew's uh, Andrew's offering. Yeah, and I think um, I was going to come in very briefly. Um, purely on the, on the notion that actually at the moment things are very difficult to organise and everything is up in the air and a number of my, <clears throat> my current upper sixth parents have been communicating with me quite regularly as kids try and navigate, you know, the, the UCAS versus gap year thing and with, um, with everything up in the air in terms of online university and travel restrictions, uh, things are understandably very, very complex at the moment. My, sorry, car going past. My, um, <laughs> I mean, my advice is that primarily um, to all those parents that uh, I, I deal with in my house, the boys are working, the boys have gone and got jobs and um, the, the current situation and, and them being in the upper sixth and the, the lack of A-level exams has given them that opportunity already. And the jobs come in the form of Sainsbury's, of um, uh, you know, working on farms and, and all sorts of jobs that you wouldn't necessarily consider initially productive or valuable for someone looking to gain experience or, or embark on a gap year. However, I would counter that. And I would say if we're talking about other opportunities, um, and Andrew might not like me saying this, but gap years aren't necessarily all about travel or international. Um, and I know that a lot of parents, as you've briefly mentioned, will often encourage their children to work for six months or work for four or five months before then traveling um, because it saves some money, it shows they're committed, it shows they're capable of, of being productive. The year hasn't necessarily been, not necessarily wasted, but it hasn't been filled unproductively with a stint over in France plus a stint in Bali or, you know. So work of any kind, I think, is is pretty paramount. If I was giving my own personal advice on this, I would say one thing you need to do at some point in your gap is get a job. Um, the maturity, the responsibility, the I think the sense of independence that this, the students will get, the children will get from that, and they won't even know it at this stage pre-job, but once they've got a job, that, that notion of having some money coming in, it being your own money, the responsibility to get up in the morning and get to work, I think that's, that's incredibly important. So my my primary suggestion is always find a job now at the moment that's hard um so you'd look at things like volunteering um i know that the government has a, a really good volunteer website that we generally direct people to um mm. just to uk volunteering volunteering is hugely um, brilliant it's fantastic on a cv mm. um yes you don't get paid however if we're talking about filling cvs and doing something different and getting a sense um, of where you might want to go with that in the future. Volunteering um, can be in a number of different you know, industries um, that, will, uh, that might suit different careers in the future or different university courses. It isn't mm. just working with animals or the homeless or working on farms. You know, there's a sure. range of different volunteering opportunities. So I would always look at volunteering if, if, um, if you can't find jobs at the moment, if that's tricky. So jobs and volunteering. And yet, so the link's just gone up there, startups. So I, I've got several friends who have started um, their own startups over the last few years and they're crying out for somebody to come and just operate their social media platform or someone to just come in and, and do, a, do a few hours a day or, or come in and, and, and work um, and lend a hand. Um, mm. Startup by nature are relatively flexible. So the benefit for a student coming into that is they get to see multiple aspects of a fledgling sort of company. Um, and they might get to boost, uh, put something on their CV that maybe sounds slightly more impressive than stacking shelves. Not, again, not to do down stacking shelves. As I said earlier, that is an incredibly valuable experience for any student leaving school that maybe hasn't had to work at, at any stage. So start working in startups. I think there's opportunities there. There's a, a website there that, that lists loads of opportunities for someone to go and get involved. Some of them aren't hugely lengthy, but they might open doors 
you show that you're a productive, positive, you know, um, student that's willing to go and do some work and engage, doors will tend to open from there as well. Um, you know, other opportunities uh, would be um, one that I know personally from family is there's a, a, a worldwide opportunities on farms. That's woofing, I think, is the verb. Um, where you go and work on a farm, it's a work stay thing, where you work for your room and board, um, and you get opportunities to just live with a family on a farm and carry out daily tasks. Um, now that's I'm just going to just going to jump in there because I know I, I've uh, spoken to a few students uh, last week who decided to go up to Scotland. There's a big demand there for fruit pickers, yeah, uh, and they're kind of doing a, a kind of around the UK travel. I think that's their Fantastic. first spot. Uh, as of, of, of work and then they're going to kind of navigate themselves around the UK so I think someone here has put so you know what kind of opportunities could you do within the UK international travel sounds glamorous and glorious and obviously yeah. with Andrew's programs there are lots of opportunities there but clearly you could ingratiate yourself within a community within the UK yeah. um, and, yeah. and there may be opportunities uh, to do that but I know there's certain as you say with, with regards to farms I spoke to somebody last week who's yeah, driving up to Scotland to, to the borders to, to help pick fruit. Um, yeah. And that's their kind of first stop. And I think they're then going to navigate their way around sort of the highlands yeah. of Scotland and then maybe go over to Ireland and, and come back to the UK. Absolutely. UK. Absolutely. I mean, there are also things like tutoring opportunities. I mean, even as an 18 year old, you are able, there are opportunities for you to work with kids, do some mm -hmm. tutoring. Yep. Um, yep. There's also the classic school gappies, which in my experience is, is a fantastic way um, of, of bridging the gap between school and university. Um, so that's working in, a, in an in independent school yeah. uh, and sort of being a sort of support member of staff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you work with sports, you sometimes have pastoral duties, etc. Yeah, and you, yeah. You, you know, you'll get taken on, uh, you'll be given some responsibility, you'll be taking on, taking on school trips, you'll go on away fixtures, you'll be responsible for the kit and equipment, which maybe isn't hugely glamorous, but you're still there yeah. and working you know, yeah. around uh, yeah. adults. Which actually, I have to say, work being having a having an experience where you are working in and around adults, I think, is also something that is hugely valuable for students leaving school before they go to university. I think having that experience of not necessarily being at the top of the tree and and having to navigate a work environment with adults is a hugely maturing. Um, right. The other thing that I would throw in, other than gappies, is nannying. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that it's not, again, it's not one of these things that you would not automatically go to. But I've a personal experience of, of friends and, and colleagues that I currently work with who are very big on the idea of go and work with, go and nanny, go and live with a family somewhere and do some nanny. Um, mm. And it might be that the, the money... That can often give you a foothold somewhere, can't oh, it? And then, and then from there you can, you can branch, yeah. branch out. Yeah. One thing I which wanted to address the question on here, so can you in turn from home? I think to your point about uh, startups, etc. I think they are very flexible yeah. and a lot of startups would consider you doing uh, potentially some work from home. Obviously Absolutely. with social media platforms, etc. Uh, they may be able to give you access to that. There's also... Uh, some sort of data jobs where you're sort of processing information independently for them and that doesn't necessarily need you within the collaborative environment obviously at the current restrictions with lockdown going into offices um, for an internship probably isn't going to be possible but I definitely think that if, if, if I was somebody who was looking to do an internship would you agree that I think it's you know speak to speak to these companies write to them ask them uh, and yeah. I'm sure that um, you know some uh, particularly those are perhaps at the more startup end of the spectrum might be more flexible yeah absolutely I th yeah completely Okay, brilliant. Andrew, if I wonder if I can come back to you with, with regards to kind of in light of the current situation. So I appreciate you're saying that uh, January, February is probably the earliest time. Um, with, regards to, with regards to kind of trying to organise uh, things, is there anything somebody can be doing now if they're deciding that, for example, they are going to take a gap year because perhaps they want to apply to university uh, uh, next year? Is there anything they can be doing now that's going to in any way be useful uh, preparation for, for, for what, they, what they might be able to do um, hopefully later on uh, in the next academic year as, as restrictions lift and, and, and opportunities uh, uh, sort of expand? Yes, yes, I think, there, I mean, we, we have quite a few people, you know, to whom we're talking, who, who are basically doing their research. So the first thing somebody should be doing is, is um, you know, giving it some thought and then um, talking to family, friends, others, you know, who might have, have done things anywhere. Um, there is an organisation um, that we're a fan member of called the Year Out Group, which is an association of independent 
um, uh, you know, gap year companies do it, all sorts of things um, mm -hmm. from Rally International and, and, you know, so all sorts. So there are all sorts of places where I think you can do your research. Um, and, uh, you know, but one of the one of the key sources resources at the moment is one, one thing we always say to people is look at the FCA, the, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office website. And in the States, there's the a similar one from the State Department, um, because, of course, that uh, well, we ask people to monitor that anyway when they are traveling. But even for now, it can give you an idea as to what's going on in those countries. Um, and obviously an awful lot at the moment, you, you will see that international flights are not happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that there's a lot of research that can be done, a lot of talking, a lot of thought, um, ra rather than just, um, you know, charging into something mm. without having done that background research. Sure. So perhaps, I mean, to, to go back to Jonathan's point, perhaps it would be an opportunity to, um, for, you know, whilst you're doing some working uh, and earning some money and hopefully um, sort of lining your pockets in order to do some travel or potentially uh, when restrictions lift, you can also be making phone calls, you know, speaking to people like yourselves, etc., trying to put plans in place. Um, I think one thing that I didn't realise when I was thinking about a gap year is the gap year stints with companies such as yourselves can be quite short. I mean, 16 weeks seems very long, but it's not the entire year. I think there's a connotation with year involved in the title that you have to be doing something for the entire year. Um, there are often some quite short um, uh, options that, 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 that exist, um, short term options, which, which students can, can, can get involved in. Um, Jonathan, I wonder if I can come back at a slightly more technical question. It's to do with um, it's, it's to do with what you can do. So there's a question here from um, from a student who's saying, at the moment, I have a conditional offer. Uh, when can I apply for a gap year after I get admission or after I join? So I think I think the question is, so if he has a conditional offer now, is there anything he can do if he wanted to take a gap year? And and if if so, what would you recommend that uh, this student did do? So. It's a tricky, um, well, it's not hugely tricky for me to answer. Um, a lot of it will be university and course specific. So my best number one top tip for anybody in this chap situation or the student situation, I should say, is to contact the university, contact the course administrators. Um, deferred entry is not something that is complicated or something that is, is alien to a lot of universities. Um, certainly, um, you can defer your entry at the point of application, you can defer your entry after application, you can defer your entry after receiving your grades. Any time you try to defer your entry or you wish to defer your entry to the following year after you've originally applied, the recommendation from UCAS um, and from schools and you know, from anyone is to contact the university. Most scenarios will be fine and the university will say yes, um, particularly if it is a conditional offer, um, you will be able to, I would have thought you'd be able to defer your entry in most cases with a conditional offer. The, compl the complications, <coughs> excuse me, complications come with unconditional offers and deferring your entry. Um, they may ask you to reapply, they may ask you to reapply in both situations. Um, but that again, this is down to university and the course administrators. It depends how competitive the course is. It depends on your application and the profile you have in terms of, you know, the CV you've built for your application, your personal statement. Um, so you can still do it. And, you know, there are situations where particularly this summer, things might become, um, things look a little bit, tricky for students this summer, given that there hasn't been the traditional um, last minute dash to the finish line. And I know um, that that might scupper some students' hopes of getting the top grades they were hoping to get. Um, in that situation, you, you'd receive your grades and if they are not what you had hoped for, either you go into clearing um, and absolutely fine opportunities come out of clearing, um, but also it might be that you keep your current grades and you choose to reapply the following year um, with your current grades. You might take up the opportunity to resit. Um, I know that there is a discussion being held at the moment for, these, for uh, another round of exams in November. Mm -hmm. There are complications around that. I think that finishes on the 
it's early June, I think they'll finish that. They'll, they'll come to a decision yep. on that. Yes, the 8th of June. Yep. 8th of June. Um, and then uh, you would hopefully have the traditional exam series January, February. Um, and then obviously another opportunity to sit your exams in June. So there are resit opportunities available if your grades are not what you'd hoped for, um, which will be the case for a lot of students this year. Um, it, it will be. Um, so my advice, I think, just to move on a little bit, if, if we're talking about resits, because I think this is hugely valuable. Um, resits are a good idea in a lot of circumstances. If you want the opportunity to, to raise your grade and resit some exams because you know you didn't do your best, or in this instance, you didn't get the opportunity to do your best, um, I think they're excellent ideas. Schools will support as much as they can. Schools will also support with university applications in your year after leaving. If you are reapplying after leaving school, you will get um, support from your school. If you choose to defer your entry and you want to reapply, school will support you as much as it can. Um, particularly with the application, the school has a duty to support you with your UCAS application. Um, I know that I've written a few references for students that left last year um, and who reapplied this year. Um, so that's that's something that's a well-trodden path, um, schools helping in terms of UCAS applications. Different schools will have different facilities for helping students prepare for resets. My The thing that I'm always conscious of reminding certainly some of the boys in my house um, or that, uh, that I've come into contact with occasionally there might be a blase kind of well if it doesn't go right I'll just resit it well there are considerations to take with that in that working at school is much more straightforward than working at home uh, when you have teachers around all the time so the the notion of resitting isn't as secure um, as it might be you have to be prepared to do a lot of work you have to be prepared to uh, find time to do your work um, if you can organize yourself and you don't come to your teachers last minute saying by the way I've got my exam next week what on earth was this unit on atmospherics all about that's not going to get you much help however if you are in regular communication with your teachers post um, after leaving, resets can be absolutely fine if you if you make the most of the opportunities that um, uh, that you presumably create. you could do resets. You could choose to reset, but also and obviously reapply to university and absolutely. then also travel and have time yeah. to, to to join one of Andrew's programs. And I mean, yeah. Andrew, do you have people, for example, that you're aware of that that come onto your programs that are resetting and you know that, that are that are reapplying to university, etc.? You is is that kind of information that you would you would be aware of? Very definitely, yes. I would say very, very definitely, and um, and and it, I, I think it can all fit in. Um, as Jonathan said, I think it can all fit in very nicely, actually. Very well. Mm. Provided so they're to... organised and you know plan mm. things. Mm. And I think even with this delay, because um, I think a lot of people are concerned about the delay for international travel, even this delay to January, I mean, typically when we have students coming to us who are preparing for to, to resit, we often say that March really is the time that is, is your kind of last foothold to prepare pr appropriately for exams that might be in June. So, so there, there still would be time potentially to fit in yeah. some, uh, some, some either some work in, you know, from now until Christmas, some travel perhaps uh, from January until uh, to, till March and then, and then, and then, and then maybe some exams and then well, yeah, maybe even some travel after the exams, maybe come and do yeah, a summer absolutely. stint with you, Andrew. Um, uh, so to so kind of combine, combine these things together. So I do think there is a, seems like there are lots of, uh, Opportunities. Just one more question. Apologies, uh, Jonathan, there's another one for you. But um, another question, which is that some universities are now offering experiences uh, entirely online. So that what they're saying is for their first year, I think Cambridge have released the information that they're only going to uh, lecture uh, online. Um, what do you think about this? Um, that there's a scenario that they say you make your best friends and you build the best experiences in year one. And as a consequence, year one is now going to be very different. Would you then recommend potentially um, taking a gap year instead of, of, um, of, of taking up that opportunity on the grounds that it's going to be very different to what university was expected to be like? I, I would. I mean, that, that's my personal opinion, my experience. This isn't a school. This isn't, you know, I'm not representing the school's opinion on this or, or anything like that. But just my personal opinion, having been through an environment where we are all working online and having done a sort of emergency school provision, 
over the last five, six weeks. Um, I think it's incredibly difficult territory, difficult from the point of view of um, productivity, self-motivation, uh, mental health, I think is, and, and mental well-being. I think in a purely online environment, I think is incredibly tricky. Now, that's not necessarily the case for everybody. That's a sweeping generalization. I'm, I'm aware of that. However, um, if you have support networks around you at home, if you are, if you're in a, pro a productive family environment where everybody sticks to a schedule and, and you've got space and you've got opportunities to get outside, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then absolutely it can work. But that's purely on the educational side of things what you are missing in terms of social life in terms of and that's not you know that's not the traditional freshers week you know social life in terms of meeting people yeah. meeting people who will become your friends for the rest of your life meeting people who um you know will provide connections for you will provide different um points of view and different opinions and just navigating a new social environment um you know trick your online Oh, yeah, it, it, it's huge trick if you're online. Now, that's not to say that, you know, like I say, a lot of this is, is a generalization and individuals circumstances will, will make their decisions for them. You know, these yeah. things might appeal to certain people. The opportunity yeah. to get to Cambridge without the fact of meeting new people might appeal to someone. I should just say about Cambridge, I think one thing is that the lectures are going to be all online, but I do think the seminars and the right. the one to one tutorials are all still going to be face to face. So people will be able to live in college. Um, but I, I, I could be wrong with this, but I'm fairly confident I'm, I'm right in that all of the lectures where the kind of big groups of people are massing together. I think those are going to be online. To, to, I think I assume I can only yeah. is that they can't manage the social distancing um, with, with the numbers that they, they, they need. But I, I do also know that you're right. Some universities have gone almost 100 percent online for everything, which obviously would change in color the experience uh, uh, yeah. somewhat um, but then it's a case sorry uh, just to jump in uh, but then it's a case of uh, these are tricky times it might be that that becomes you know not to scare my at all but that might become necessarily a new norm in many situations there are universities yep. that won't have huge lecture halls and the you know the capacity to squeeze everybody in social dis with social distancing so you know, we should be prepared, I think, for thinking about the fact that um, there might be a, a larger online element to a lot of university courses moving forward. Yep. Yep. But just to reiterate, in this instance, I think, you know, if you are a school leaver this year or next year and you are thinking about, you know, how the current pandemic situation might affect your opportunities and you are slightly nervous about going to university in an all online environment or if you're a parent and you're worried about how productive your child will be in an all online environment i think a gap is a perfect opportunity whether you travel or not whether it's glamorous or not whether it is creative or not i think a gap year just in terms of a bit of work and a bit of maturity uh, earning a bit of money as i said earlier i think that's hugely valuable um, and it's a good it's an excellent stop gap if you're worried about these online courses Right. And I guess the key thing to say to the person who I think raised that question is that obviously if you have an offer um, and you it's conditional and you're thinking about deferment, I think the first thing I would do is be speaking to that university and saying, look, uh, I'm thinking about deferring a year. Is this something Would my offer still stand? Um, because as you say, as you rightly pointed out, they may ask you to reapply. And obviously in some situations where your place might have been, your offer might have been hard fought, take Cambridge as an example, you know, where there may have been admissions tests, maybe interviews as well, if you're doing medicine or something like that. You, you may want to consider whether deferment is, is quite right for you. Um, so I think the first border call is definitely to speak to those in your school, but also then to speak to, to the university um, before you make any kind of big decisions. And obviously people like Jonathan, but also people at universities will be able to, to support you. Support I'd you. also add as well, uh, perhaps that's everything you've just said, I'd reiterate that tenfold. Uh, also, don't be afraid to call UCAS. They've yeah. got advice. Yeah, like, they've, they've got a wonderful helpline, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely um, brilliant. Um, yeah, um, it, it is, it's, someone has just put in just a, a point that some universities aren't offering a deferral. That, that, that's very true, that they, they don't offer deferrals. Um, uh, unfortunately, in those cases, if you did want to take a gap year, you would then simply have to reapply. What's worth um, a, a point of here, which is uh, of noting, is that 
I think a lot of people assume that if you reapply to the same university again, there's some sort of black mark that's associated with you and that you rejected them the first time round when they gave you an offer and, and, and you're reapplying again. Um, as someone who applied twice to university to almost exactly the same group, um, I can assure you that doesn't happen. And also, I guess, just um, and I don't know whether Jonathan, you've got any points to raise on this, but um, the sheer numbers of applications, it's very, very difficult to keep a, a record and a register of, of, of those kinds of individuals. And of course, people apply to Oxbridge, where it's much more personal, the experience uh, multiple times, um, and will often get in the second time around. Yeah, I, I will just um, add to that. So the notion of um, some universities not offering deferred places, absolutely. I'm not aware that there's a, 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 any particular university, and as I said, I'm not, this isn't something that I am hugely um, knowledgeable about in terms of the whole university market, but I'm not aware of any universities that purely offer no deferrals. It, in most situations where a university doesn't offer a deferral will be based on courses, depending on compet um, the competition for places, the provision of places. So it may, it, it may, in most situations, it will be likely that it's the course at the university that's not um, deferrable. Brilliant. Fantastic. Um, I've got to slightly, Andrew, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here because I realise this is a question that, uh, that perhaps you don't necessarily feel like you might have the credentials to answer. But if I, can't, <laughs> if I pose it to both of you, um, and then I'm, I'm sure we can perhaps all three of us chip in. But I've got a question is, any recommendations for a gap year for a student who plans to go on studying a fine arts degree. I appreciate that your um, that, that perhaps your field of work is is, is yeah. international. It's within communities. It's uh, it's travel out there. But um, uh, you you also have uh, you've got fully grown up children in the world of work now. So so you will have had as an experience uh, as, as a parent. Do, do you have any kind of initial thoughts of what they might do in a in a well, in, in I, the current I pandemic? I, I, yes, I think um, they should take a look at that. There is an organisation which is a member of the Year Out group as well called um, um, uh, Art History Abroad, mm -hmm. um, which I, I know may not be quite on the button for, uh, for someone who's doing fine art, but they do fantastic um, history of art tours of Italy and so on. At the moment, of course, they may not be... Um, they may not be running right now, mm. Mm. but um, Art History Board is, is a very good, and I think if you ha if they have a look at that organisation and from there might be able to sort of Google into others. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I'm familiar with that, of that organisation. And of course, with a lot of these pr um, providers, they're, they're being flexible. So they, they may have come up with alternatives. They may have come up with online courses that you might be able to do um, where you know, you, you, albeit that you can't travel to Venice or you can't travel to Rome or you can't, you, you can't go and be stationed uh, somewhere where they would normally send you. It may be that they could give some sort of learning experience, some sort of offering, which again, edifies, builds the CV and the experience, uh, but, but you might be able to do it from your, your own home. And we're able to see West End Productions now from our own home. So I'm sure um, uh, that would be a, a really interesting one. It's also worth noting, um, I think um, someone's also mentioned it, I was about to mention it too. So thank you for mentioning that in our chat. Um, uh, John Hall, which offers offers really good art history courses um, 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 and they do them in, in, in Venice and Rome and, and again they may be someone that offers a sort of an online option. Uh, Jonathan any thoughts from you? Um, I, I know you're a geographer but but maybe a bit of an artistic background coming through and if you have uh, if you have anyone in your upper six who, who's thinking about uh, fine arts um, any suggestions for that question? I, I would always you know I, I'll leave the the sort of more targeted placements to, to people that know better, but I would always push volunteering. And I would always push things, you know, National Trust, English Heritage, um, any local um, museum, gallery. There, are, These are not, fine arts traditionally is not an institution that that pays hugely well, that, that, is, that has, um, you know, clearly defined career. It's not like medicine or, or finance. So there are a lot of smaller organisations that need a lot of help. And so I would look around, look locally. If, you know, if we are worried about international travel, look locally, look nationally, uh, at larger yeah. charities, larger organisations, but also, yeah, the local museum. It's, it's, you know, think of it in terms of new experience, put it on your CV. It doesn't have to be hugely long. You can, it, it can be something you do that's productive whilst you consider other options. Um, yep. Yeah. 
I was going to say one thing that I've seen a couple of things. Uh, Will actually, uh, the founder of Keystone, shared it with me. Is uh, a, a boy I think in his upper six. Uh, he started a podcast. He loves rugby. He started the podcast. He's asked a few people uh, to come on. He's got some amazing guests. Um, I, there's a local gallery in the Cotswolds where I live, um, uh, run by a, quite an elderly couple, and somebody's helping them taking photos to put their pictures online. Um, so I think, there, as you say, that there, there may be creative opportunities that that students could could in, engage with and, and and again that's such a good thing to talk about on a cv um, yeah what, so, what they've learned from it etc you've just um you've just reminded me of something one of my my upper sixth is um doing a podcast and he's interviewing um sports people um uh, for his podcast and it's brilliant he's got lots of listeners it's on spotify um and this started a month ago two months ago and um that's something that he's created he can be proud of there's a record of it, you know, it gives him a, an insight into potentially careers he might think of doing in the future. This is something he hadn't considered at all up until this point. And the, the situation we found ourselves in had sort of necessitated some, some creativity in him. And I think, um, yeah, don't, don't necessarily, if, if you have that, that, that spark and you don't necessarily look for well-trodden paths, if, if you want to be creative, try something different. People are making it work. So, um, I just want to, we've got another question because I think we're kind of at the end of our questions anyway, but um, I might fire this one at you, um, Andrew. Um, the, the question is, does it, does it matter what you do in a gap year? Um, as, as, as long as you show up at the start of, of, of your university after your gap year, do, does it really matter? I mean, I guess there is a technical point here, which, which I'll feed in some courses, if you are going to take a gap year or you're deferring a place, they will require you to uh, keep it to be up to speed, for example, in certain subjects. I know uh, some Cambridge courses, if you do get deferment and you want to, to use maths, for example, they will expect your maths level to have been kept uh, in tune, like a, a sort of a, a, an athlete, I guess, uh, over that period, so you don't lose fitness, so you can hit the ground running when you start. Um, but do, does it matter what you do in a gap year? I guess it's a... I, I, I would argue, as we said at the beginning about meaningfulness, if you like, that I think, I think if, if you're um, taking the meaning of education in the widest possible sense, then I think this is a, this is a life learning experience to gain all sorts of soft skills of, you know, communicating with people you and communicating, living, um, meeting people you've never met before, completely different types. Um, I, I, so I, I don't think it does. I, I, I I would say one thing that um, I don't know if they're still doing it, but there um, a few years ago, I heard that I think it was Unilever. And um, I mean, Jonathan might know better than me on this, but some companies, yeah. the larger companies in the past, had actually introduced a section in their you know, recruitment process, a, a, a question, which was, did you take a gap year? And you could earn negative and positive points, because, for example, if you've just backpacked around somewhere, and just sat on beaches and you know drunk beer and all the rest of it um I, that can be marked as a negative opportunity if you've used it to do something interesting and different and gain something from it then i think uh that can be hugely beneficial to the individual but also to their to their um you know, their, their early career a toe through the door can i tell a quick story uh, no, sorry. Uh, only because um, I've got, <laughs> I've just got to clear up a few more questions and then we'll come back to you for your story, I promise you. But it's a very good point that you're making that with regards to gap years being talking points within interviews um, uh, at, um, at, at big companies. I, I know I was definitely asked that before. I, I flirted with the idea of going to the city instead of becoming a teacher and definitely that was a, a question point for me. One other point I'll note, which I think Jonathan alluded to, is that big companies offer also gap year internships, which I know are very popular. Um, now they may still be running. It, obviously, I don't know. Uh, those are people who've applied. I'm sure have been informed. Um, but again, these may be, be be willing to ask. People can do gap year commissions in the army. Again, these have changed slightly over the last couple of years. Um, but again, this might be something. The problem with these sorts of things that I'm talking about, they take long. They have selection processes, and often, you know, we're we're now quite a long way through the year. So it may be that you would have had to have been thinking about them two to three months ago. I just want to clear up a couple of questions here. So, uh, from June the eighth, international students will will have to quarantine for two weeks upon arrival in the UK. Can a student arrive? Um, uh, 
for two weeks earlier and then essentially quarantine on uh, university campuses. Are universities providing assistance with this? I think just plainly and simply, I, I wouldn't know that specifically for the university. And I think it's just very much worthwhile speaking to the universities directly about this. I'm sure where they can help, um, that they would absolutely um, um, be, be, be help, uh, be, 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 be helpful if they can be. And so I definitely would speak to them. Um, is there a deadline for universities other than Cambridge to declare what their arrangements are going to be for 2020? Um, no, I don't think the answer, I don't know if Jonathan, you, would, you know any more than I do, but I don't think there is an answer. So if they decide to offer online only or, or, or kind of a hybrid of online, offline, um, I'm, I'm fairly sure they, they'll just need to do that before they start um, term. So they've probably got time. Uh, I don't think there is a deadline unless I'm wrong. I've not, I've not heard any different. Yeah. I've not yeah. Heard any. Yeah. Um, and then just one other point, which I just want to kind of point to you, uh, Andrew, and then, and then we may have time for your story, we may not. Um, but um, is that someone said, I would say that backpacking and navigating around the world as a young person is a huge learning experience. Um, yeah. and, um, and so I guess that's suggestion that you're, you're pitting this idea of a community based project and being in one place for a long period of time and ingratiating yourself there versus um, um, uh, sort of just traveling around. Um, what, you know, what do you say about that? Because to be honest, Andrew, um, I, I, I'm, I'm tended and minded to agree that, that traveling for an extended period of time with a backpack on your back teaches you a lot about yourself. A absolutely, I quite agree. I, I think you should do both. And I'll tell you why, I, I'll give you an example. So the, a, a young girl called Zoe White who traveled with us some years ago, she backpacked around through Southeast Asia, down to Australia and all the rest of it and had a fantastic time. She then went to our project up in Northeast India in a community called The Lectures. Ten years later, um, Zoe is still going back every two years to the community in which she was living and working. And she is the first, when she does talks for us, she's the first to say that, she, that her backpacking is all a bit of a blur now. It was great fun and she had a super time. And I'm not mm. saying don't have a good time. But in terms of the, the, the value of the experience, her time in India, 10 years later, was far greater. So all I'm say, I, I would say, do both. I, yeah, I really I would, absolutely. A bit of structure, a bit of unstructured time can be, yes. can be, be very yes. good in both, both, both instances. Um, brilliant. Um, I just, uh, I'm just, just having a look just to check that we, we've answered all of our questions and we've done all of our points and then I'll just give you an opportunity to close uh, any comments if, if you have any. Um, but um, so there is a question here that if you're an overseas applicant, you, you've applied to a UK university um, and because of the current situation, you've decided you perhaps don't want to come to the UK. Are you able to kind of defer your place and then perhaps uh, apply to university or, or go to a university locally, wherever you're coming from. Um, that to me sounds quite complicated. It may well be possible though, in those UK universities which have uh, satellite campuses uh, internationally. I can think of universities in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, in Singapore, uh, in Hong Kong. It may be the case that you're able to defer um, or, or maybe able to, you're able to kind of do your first year potentially um, within within a, a kind of satellite campus. I, I, I worry about that because techni technically that sounds quite quite uh, quite logistically complicated, but it, it may well be possible. The, the first port of call, as I think Jonathan and I have said uh, consistently, is you need to just speak to the university. I think you need to ask them. Um, I, I, I think they'll understand you have concerns um, about, uh, given the current circumstances. Um, Can I, I'll just jump in quickly, yeah. Depen it, it, depending on the offer that you've yeah. been given as well, um, whether it's conditional or unconditional. Um, some, some universities, I've got an example of a, a, a boy in my, um, in my sixth form at the moment, has got an unconditional offer to a university, um, uh, but he's also got a conditional offer to another university that he would rather go to. The trick is, the tricky thing for him is <clears throat> in committing to his place and accepting the offer. If he accepts the unconditional, great, he's accepted an unconditional. However, that unconditional offer goes away if he, if he puts down his first choice as, as another university. So if you are still planning to look around at other universities, the university may have the right to rescind. Um, if it's an unconditional offer, they may have the right to rescind that offer if you do not commit to it because they, they, they have to manage their places and they have to fill their places. And if they, yeah. they like you and they, they give you the unconditional and you don't take it, they, they, they might not be able to keep that place for you. 
Brilliant. Uh, the timing has been spot on, uh, but you've got sort of it's 20 seconds each to close. Uh, Andrew, do you have any sort of uh, sort of last minute advice uh, to, to anyone out there who's uh, who, who's still dreaming of going internationally um, uh, on a gap year to do some sort of um, uh, some project somewhere? No, I, I would just say I, I, I think um, going back to what we were saying right at the beginning and what I said about Harvard, I think everybody should take a gap year. Not just the, I think these times are actually particularly suited to it. I think it will be a particular challenge for young people possibly to do some of the things that we've been talking about. But actually, I think it's a fantastic time to do it. And I, I know it's a window of opportunity in young people's lives that will close. And when it closes, it's gone forever. And I would mm. say, grab it. And, and I think your, your, your recommendation of looking at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office website is a really good one because I think that will give indication of when people can travel. And, uh, and, and I guess your, your advice of just speaking to gap year companies and, and trying to get a sense of what they can and can't do and, and when and uh, gap years aren't a year long. It, you could do a six week or a 12 week program somewhere. Jonathan, uh, anything from you lastly? And then I, I will thank you and let you go. Super. Um, no, I'd just say be positive, be productive. And if I was encouraging a year, be really positive about it, be hungry to find something, communicate with all sorts of organizations, any area of interest you have. I would, I would really try and find something paid, unpaid, whether it's an opportunity to do travel, whether it's an opportunity to you know, further investigate a career. It, it, it doesn't really matter as long as you are positive and productive. I think those are really the key, the key messages. Great. Um, well, thank you very much both. Uh, it's been, I, I've learned a lot um, and I'm sure it's been hugely useful for a lot of others. Um, we will be uh, sending out this recording and also sharing all of the links, the many links that, that, that both, uh, both Andrew and Jonathan have mentioned. Um, we also have uh, a webinars upcoming, um, so please do, 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 do look at our website and, and, and uh, join our, our, our mailing list if, if you'd like more notifications of those. But thank you very much both. Uh, enjoy the sunshine and um, uh, we'll, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye. And thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.